We can set up idols without worshiping statues. What happens? You put something first before God. It's your job, it's your career, it's a relationship, it's music, it's a form of entertainment, it's a food, a beverage. Something is more powerful than God or more important than God to you. What happens? Your senseless mind is darkened. What happens next? Sexual immorality. And look at what Paul goes on to say. Romans 128. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and to improper conduct. They were filled with all manner of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Or ruthless. Look at all the sins Paul links here together. Idolatry, sexual immorality, gossip. The catechism treats gossip under murder. Because in gossip, what you do is you assassinate another person's character. Slanderers. Boastful? Disobedient to parents. Oh, that's not a big deal, right? Remember what I was talking about yesterday? The mystical body of Satan? Paul links all of these things together. Though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve those who practice them. Deep down, they know right and wrong, somewhere. They have some consciousness of right and wrong. And yet, they want to spread this behavior to others. Sin makes you stupid. Sin darkens the insulin. You should be able to know. Things like the Ten Commandments, St. Thomas Aquinas, and the Fathers and Doctors of the Church, the Catechism, would explain that the Ten Commandments represent the natural law. That even apart from divine revelation, we should know thou shalt not murder. We should be able to know that. We should be able to know thou shalt not steal. We should be able to know that just from reason alone. If you allow people to steal, then you can't have any functioning society. Civilization crumbles. Just using reason alone, you should be able to figure out that you shouldn't have stealing, adultery, murder. You should be able to know that there is one God and that you should worship him. Have no gods besides me. The Ten Commandments are something that we should be able to know even from our reason alone. And yet... At Mount Sinai, God has to deliver them to Israel and speak them. Why? Well, the Israelites sin in the golden calf, and we see. Their minds have been darkened. God has to make his law known because sin has darkened our intellect. Sin makes you stupid. Things that you should know are wrong, you start to justify you think, you know, it's not that bad. I'm not really hurting other people. And you start rationalizing your sin. And before you know it, you're not even feeling guilty anymore. You're in the back seat of, the, of your car making out with your girlfriend or with your boyfriend. And it's just a little, and you know you shouldn't be doing this and you feel bad. But then the next time you go a little bit further, and the next time you go a little bit further, and the next time you go a little bit further, and before you know you're doing things you never thought you were capable of. Sin makes you stupid. We see that in the Old Testament. We see that with a man named David. God describes him as a man after his own heart. That's a pretty high recommendation, wouldn't you say? How would you like God to reveal himself to you and say, you are a man after my own heart? Wow. And yet David sins. We read about his sin in, in uh, 2 Samuel 11, and you can actually trace out the downward spiral of David's sin. It doesn't just start off with murder. It's like the frog in the, in the frying pan. 
You turn it up slowly. Let's read the story. It's there on your handout. Bottom of page two. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Now, what's wrong with this picture? What is this the time of year for? Kings to go out to battle. And so David went out to battle. No. He stayed in Jerusalem. Yeah, it was getting a little ferocious out there. I think I'll stay back. I'll let all my army go in harm's way, but I'll stay home. Verse 2. So David should have been fighting, but he's, he stays home. He's not doing what he should have been doing. Verse 2. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch. Talk about a couch potato. <laughs> David doesn't get up until late in the afternoon. You think you've got a problem with your alarm clock. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. David's still in bed. So not only was David lazy, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. Now he's sleeping in. He's living a life of slothfulness. And he goes walking upon the roof of the king's house. And he saw from the roof a woman bathing. Okay, now David, there's a woman bathing. What should you do? Look away. Look away, David. Turn away, David. Nothing to see over there, David. So he goes up on his roof, and he can look down at all the people. Probably not a good thing to do. He's up there, and he sees a naked lady. And, it says, and the woman was very beautiful. How did David know that? Because he kept looking. <laughs> so you see, David should have gone out to fight, but he didn't. So then he becomes slothful and he stays in late. Then he goes up to his roof to kind of look down on everybody, and he sees a naked lady. And instead of looking away, he keeps looking. Father Stan Fortuna tells young people, the more you look, the more you'll see. The more you see, the deeper you will be. Warning them against pornography. Well, David could have used that advice. And David sent and inquired about the woman. Now, he could have just, okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have looked at that. i got to get her out of my mind. But he doesn't do that. He's like, i got to learn more about her. So David gets information. And one said, is not this Bathsheba? Because she's taking a bath. No, that's just... Sorry. <laughs> It has nothing to do with that. Anyway. <laughs> the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So she's married. And David says, oh, she's married. I should totally leave this one. So what am I thinking? No. So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him. And he lay with her. David sent messengers. He shouldn't have said. They took her. He should have said, you know what? Take her back. She, they bring her to her. Same. And then he lays with her. He sleeps with her. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am with child. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked Job, uh, asked how, how, how uh, Job was doing, and how the people fared, and how the war prospered. Poor Uriah. You know, he's like, what? The king wants to see me? <laughs> right, you know? I get to go talk to the king. Hey, David's talking, how's the war? Man, this guy's great. He's just, I'm becoming friends with the king. Right? Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Now, feet are not just feet here, okay? This is a euphemism for having relations, okay? By the way, this relates to the apostles at the Last Supper. <coughs> Jesus washes the apostles' feet. Going down and washing your feet, David's telling him, go down and father a child with your wife. Have relations, father, become a father. Washing feet is a symbol of spiritual fatherhood, but there's no charge for that. That's just extra. Okay, anyway. <laughs> and Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. The king sends him a gift. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. 
David won't go sleep with his wife. David knows she's pregnant. He says, come on, Uriah. When they tell David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths out in tents because they're in battlefield. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go down to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? Everybody else is sacrificing. Who am I to go down and enjoy the company of my wife? As you live, as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Uriah is a righteous man. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And now David could have gone, you know what? I really messed up. Uriah, I'm sorry. He, he could, I'm not, not going to get this guy. No, David doesn't think that. He's going to try again. So David lies to him. Tomorrow I'm just going to let you go. It's fine. But what David does is he invites him to, to eat in his presence and drink so that he made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord. But Uriah still didn't go down to his house. Uriah thought, you know, he kind of, you know, greased the wheels, you know. Get him drunk, lower his inhibitions, now he'll go see his wife. But no, he's not having any of this. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. So David has gone from simply not going out to the battlefield to now plotting the murder of Uriah. This is the man who wouldn't kill Saul, the wicked king, because he's the Lord's anointed. Look at how sin breeds sin. And what happens? And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was also slain. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting. And he instructed the messenger, when you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king's anger arises, and he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of uh, Jerobusheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone upon him from the wall so that he died there? And Thebes, that's in uh, the book of Judges. There's a battle and this woman just holds a big rock over the wall and kills the guy, right? David's like, why were you fighting so close to the... You... I'm sorry, he doesn't say that, but Joab says to the messenger, if David gets mad and he goes on this tyrant and he thinks I'm a bad strategist, then, he said... You shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So tell David that, and I'll call him down. Right? Okay. So the messenger went. This is hilarious. And he told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. And the messenger said to David, this is what he said, The men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Right? He throws it in there. He's not going to wait for David to get mad, right? <laughs> Maybe he could see David's face getting upset, right? Why would they do this? So he throws it out there really quickly. David said to the messenger, Thus you shall tell Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devourer is now one and now another. Strengthen your attack upon the city and overthrow it and encourage him. David could have heard the report and repented. And even when he hears that the man is dead, he doesn't repent. It's not until Nathan the prophet comes and tells him a parable about a man who kills his neighbor's little ewe lamb that he loves and he tells David, you the man. And that doesn't mean something good there, right? He says, thou art the man who is like this man who kills his neighbor's little ewe lamb. And then David, because Nathan the prophet speaking through the word of the Lord, then, Nathan, then David repents. But David only repents because of a supernatural intervention. Because of God's word through the prophet. Sin darkens the intellect. What's the only thing that can enlighten, enlighten the intellect? God's grace. The devil has to tempt us 
to committing sin. And he has good things to tempt us with. The devil doesn't make anything. God made everything. Amen? And everything he made was good. So the devil only has good things to tempt us with. His goal is to get us to choose lower goods over higher goods. To choose goods that are not enjoyed in their proper context. That's what the devil does. And once you taste that sin, you enjoy it. And then it's harder to resist a second time. It wasn't a big deal. It was just a little lie. I had to tell it. What would happen to me if I didn't lie about that? I had no choice. The ends justify the means. Or I should say, a good end justifies an evil means. People say that. This is how the devil works. The catechism says, this is why man stands in need of being enlightened by God's revelation. Not only about those things that exceed his understanding, but also about those religious and moral truths which of themselves are beyond the grasp of reason. So that even in the present condition of the human race, they could be known by all men with ease, with firm certainty, and with no admixture of error. God wants us to know the truth. So he reveals them to us in divine revelation, in Christ, and especially in sacred scripture. Sacred scripture is nothing less than the word of God. Right? We say scripture is inspired by God. What does it mean that we say scripture is inspired by God? It doesn't mean that it's always inspiring. <laughs> right? Inspiration is nothing less than divine authorship. God is the author of scripture. We could also talk about how the Bible is authored by humans who used all their own faculties and powers. So the Bible is fully divine and fully human, like Christ in the incarnation. The word incarnate is fully divine, fully human, like us in all things but sin. And the popes have explained that sacred scripture is fully divine. God is the author. It's fully human. Matthew is very different than Mark. Right? When you read Matthew, Matthew starts off with this long genealogy. And he begot, and he begot, and he begot, and he begot. You're like, Holy Spirit, you could have used the editor. Right? <laughs> and then you read Mark's gospel and everything is immediately, immediately, immediately. Read Mark 1 before you go home or when you get home today. Everything Mark says is immediately, immediately, immediately. Like Jesus is casting out demons. There's no, there's no genealogies. There are no long speeches in Mark. There's one long speech in Mark. Why? Because Mark is writing to a Roman audience, and the Romans are like 21st century American males. <laughs> they like the gladiator matches. They just wanted to see stuff get blowed up. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Right? Don't give me a lot of theology, a lot of drama. We just want to see action, right? So Jesus like, casted out demons everywhere in Mark. Matthew's very different than Mark. Right? God uses the, the human writers. They write with their own style. So it's fully divine, fully human. And scripture, like Christ, is like all, us and all things but sin. Scripture's like all other human literature, except without error. Scripture is God's word to us. I wanted to give this talk today. Because I'm so concerned about the way we're engaging culture as Catholics. Because many of us can fall prey, me included, to thinking that the way we're going to win back our culture is getting a better political candidate. Hmm. Or having a better presentation of logical arguments. And that somehow we can win back our culture. On, for example, the issue of homosexual marriage. I'm just going to be blunt. That we can win the issue of homosexual marriage if we just leave the Bible at home and engage in rational arguments. But you know what? The Bible was given to us because sin makes you stupid. And you know what? The reason God gave us scripture and divine revelation is in one part because the mysteries of faith exceed our reason, but also because we can't use our reason effectively because of sin. The reason God gave us the Bible is because reason is not enough. And so as soon as Catholics say we can't use the Bible to explain the teaching on homosexuality, guess what? We've lost. Because the reason God gave us the Bible is because reason alone is not sufficient. Do you understand what I'm saying? So people say, well, what's the hope for our culture then? I mean, we can try. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't vote, right? We, I'm not saying we shouldn't get uh, politicians elected who support the right to life. And marriage, I'm not saying that that's bad. We need to do that. But we need to recognize that if you think you're going to win the culture through politics, you're done. Because sin makes you stupid. Right? 
So how do we win the culture back? Somebody would say to me, well, then you're saying there's no hope. No. Pope Benedict came to America, and he had a message for us. Christ is our hope. There is no hope for our culture apart from evangelization. There is no hope for our culture apart from Christ. We are not going to have a secular utopia where somehow people just using their reason alone comes to understand what morality is. Because you know what? Sin makes you dumb. As Catholics, we need the Bible. We need Christ's word. We need Christ. We need to know Christ. And we especially come to know Christ in Scripture. Amen? Amen. St. Jerome. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 112. It's magisterial and Catholic teaching. It's been cited by popes for a long time. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. If you don't know Scripture, you can't know Christ. If you don't know the Bible, you can't know Christ. And yet, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. How important that is studying sacred scripture. The catechism says we need to talk often and at length with God. Can't have a relationship with God if you don't talk with him often and at length. And a conversation involves a two-way street. You, I'm sure you know people. You, the phone rings, you see it, you pick it up, and you think, oh my gosh, here it comes. You put the phone up to the air and it's just like, and you're just waiting for them to take a breath. Say, okay, get go now, bye bye. You know? you know people like that? You talk with them and you look in their eyes and the whole time you're talking, you can just see they're just thinking about what they're going to say next. You know people like this? They're not listening to you, they're just waiting for you to shut up. All right? What kind of conversation can you have with someone? What kind of relationship can you have with someone you never listen to? How do we have a conversation with God? How do we listen to Him? It's in Scripture. The Bible isn't just what God said, it's what God says. Amen? Amen? If we have ears to listen. I remember, this was brought home to me, uh, I was trying to figure out where to go and do my master's and, in, in theology. And I have a very close family. You know, Terry lives very close to my parents. And six, I've, I'm one of six kids, and I love my parents, and I just couldn't imagine going out of state. Yet Scott Hahn invited me to come live with his family and study with him in Franciscan. It was kind of a hard offer to turn down. But I really love my family and I love everybody out here. How could I leave? I was so torn because I knew this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but at the same time, I was going to have a hard time. So I went to Mass. It was the day before I had to send in my, my final paperwork to where I was going to go. And I'm sitting at Mass and the Gospel is read. Jesus said to the apostles, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. <laughs> okay, Jesus, you don't have to be so subtle. I get it. <laughs> Later, I moved to San Diego, and there were all these fires in San Diego, and I was getting worried. They were far away from me, but I'm a hypochondriac, so I was freaking out. And I have all these books in my office, you can imagine. Uh, I'm a bibliophile. And I have all these books I've invested a lot of money in. And I was getting nervous because the fires were still like, you know, 10 miles away. But I felt like they were close. So I thought, I got to get all the books in the car. So I started throwing all my books in my car, right? <laughs> like, I got to save them, you know? <laughs> I'm really freaking out. And I, and I drive to Mass. I got all my books in the car. All right, all, all, as many as I could fit. Now, you can't even see it in the windows, right? It's just like books everywhere, right? <laughs> Jam, packed, right? And I, and I get to Mass, and I walk in, and the Gospel's read. And Jesus says, I kid you not, this was the Gospel. Jesus says, I've come to set the world on fire. <laughs> it's all going up in flames. There's nowhere to go. And I realized that the Lord was telling me, you know, you need to be a little bit more detached. <laughs> God always speaks to us in sacred scripture. I'm sure you've had that experience where you're at Mass and they read it and you're like, how did they know? <laughs> Who told them? <laughs> the Lord is speaking to us in Scripture. Right now we're trying to buy a house. My family, it's a first house. Please pray for us. Um, we really need a house. We're in a real small two-bedroom home with three, or two-bedroom apartment with three kids. 
and we really need to get this house. And we put in an offer, we're praying for it. Please, if you could all spare a decade of the rosary, I'd really appreciate it. You know that inopportune widow who keeps knocking at the door and she doesn't go away? My goal is to get an army of inopportune widows to come to the Lord's door. So if you could please pray for us, that'd be great. But as we're praying for, for getting this house, it's, we're waiting to get approval from their bank. But anyway, as we're going through this process, I'm going to Mass. And like every day, the response to Psalm is, one day in your house is better than a thousand elsewhere, you know? <laughs> I long to be in your house, O oh Lord, you know? <laughs> Everything is about the Lord's house all of a sudden. You know? <laughs> yes, it's God's house, not this house. I get it. Okay, God, thank you. <laughs> it would be nice, though. Be nice. Anyway, I'm sure that's happened to you. But you know what? That's the way the whole Bible works. God is trying to say something to you in every passage of Scripture, every day. Do you have ears to hear what he wants to say? The Bible is what we need to be able to transform our culture because it's the word of God and the very words of God. God is trying to speak to us. Will we listen? That's the question. Vatican II. I'll close with this. In the sacred books, the father who is in heaven comes lovingly to meet his children and talks with them. Do you want to hear your father speak to you? Head to your nearest Blessed Sacrament Chapel and open up your Bible because he's just, literally, Jesus is dying. He has died to speak to you. Will we listen? If a beloved received a love letter from the one that he loves, he doesn't put it on the kitchen table and get, to, get around to reading it. He can't wait if he's separated from his beloved to tear it open and read the words that is on the page. The beloved, she can't wait to open the letter from her beloved. Christ is our bridegroom. He's the bridegroom of the church, and he wants to speak to you in his letter in, in sacred scripture. Don't let it collect dust on a shelf. Let him speak to you, and let him speak to our culture through the word. Let us turn now in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we know that you speak to us in your word, which is in sacred scripture. We know we, you speak to us through your Son. Help us to have an encounter with your Son in sacred scripture. Help us to see, as Pope Benedict sa says, that God has a human face in Jesus Christ. Through prayerful reading of the Bible, Help us to hear your voice, to be no longer ignorant of you, and to be able to combat all the evil that is in the world, so that clearly knowing the truths of Scripture, we can be your witnesses in a culture of death. Help us, Lord, to remember what John tells us, that your Son has come. He is the way, the truth, and the light. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overcome it. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Paul, pray for us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. teach everything he commanded them to teach. New ways to communicate God's word. Present positive images to our people. This message of truth and salvation. Culture of uh, encounter. Gospel of Christ worldwide.
Shalom World TV. Twenty-four-seven, faith-filled, dynamic, virtue-building, commercial-free, family-friendly, Catholic, charismatic channel to the whole world. Promote the gift of church teaching. Dedicated for the new evangelization. Mentor the young into a deeper embrace of the Catholic faith. Wonderful contributions to the church. People of prayer. Attractive people, attractive messages. Peace of Christ. Promote the values of life. This is media at its very best. The voice of the church. With great love. Taking this to the next step. Shalom World TV. Shalom. 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 Shalom.